guys, so we picked up two more hypothesis tests in chapter 11. We picked up the goodness of fit test and the chi-squared test for independence. And if you're still using that overall spreadsheet or that flowchart um, of all of your tests, you'll see them here in terms of the first one was the goodness of fit and then the chi-squared test for independence and all of those assumptions and what you do with your calculator to get there. So just keep in mind you had that as a reference. We also talked about the flow chart you could use, and this is in combo for all of the chapters from chapters nine through 13, in terms of how to figure out, how to determine which hypothesis test you're gonna run. Okay, so for a chi-squared goodness of fit, all right, for defining parameters, right, we have all of our proportions that we're gonna define, and you're gonna tell me here in the null what your null proportions are equal to. And we did two types of this problem. All right, in example one, we had the um, type of nut where we had, I think it was almonds, macadamias, brazils, and cashews. And we had each of those proportions set to different numbers. I think one was 52%, one was 27%, I think there was a 13% and 8%. So sometimes your null proportions, they will be equal to different numbers. And then in example two, when we were talking about the number of defects made each day of the week, not only were these all equal to 20%, if you go back to example two and look at that, they were all equal to each other. So there are times when you will take 100% and you will divide by the number of categories to figure out what your null proportions will be. So those are the two types of problems, okay? So again, sometimes they'll all be equal to the same number. And then like I said, in example one, when we had the different types of nuts, we had, I think, like I said, I think one was equal to 52%. I think there was a 27%. There was maybe a 13 and an 8%. So sometimes they're equal to different numbers. Sometimes you have to take 100% divide by the number of categories to find out what that null proportion is. Alternate, again, the null's not true. All right, we're gonna default to our alpha level of 5% unless I give you one. Um, we've got our deal breaker assumption and that expected cell counts have to be greater than or equal to five. And we're gonna get expected cell counts here by N times P. All right, and we always want the random sample or sample representing your population. All right, so let me move this up. So we got the rest of this in view. Okay, so from there, we're gonna be on the chi-squared distribution. You're running a chi-squared goodness of fit test. Degrees of freedom, it's now number of categories minus one. All right, here's our formula for the chi-squared test statistic. It's always observed minus expected squared over expected. You'll get some number, all right? You can use your lists to, to figure out that number or some of you have the Goff test on your calculator. We're gonna get a p-value using chi-squared CDF. It's always a number between zero and one as it's a probability. You'll sketch me a picture, all right? Making sure that you label your graph with chi-squared and that number from step 10 should be on your graph somewhere. It will always be a right tailed test and the mean will be just to the right of the peak and the mean is your degrees of freedom. All right, um, and sometimes those chi-square graphs will look more like a hyperbola, just that weird funky thing coming in um, from a higher uh, Y value number. All right, so then we gotta state our conclusion. Am I gonna reject or fail to reject and whether or not I have sufficient evidence? All right, so chi-square, goodness of fit. All right, then we had our chi-squared test for independence, and this is the one and only time you can skip step one. Enjoy it. All right, you had your three options for how you write your null. All right, the two categorical variables were independent, had no association or had no relationship, and their complements are here, right? Not independent and association, a relationship. Decide which of those three you like. I'm good with any of them. All right, we've got our standard alpha. We default to 5% if we don't know. Um, we've got the same assumptions, right? We need a random sample or a sample represents our population. And you need that expected count to be greater than or equal to five. But the, the kicker here is your expected counts are now row total times column total over grand total. So it's a little bit more convoluted than just N times P. We're still in our chi-squared distribution. We're running our chi-squared test for independence. Degrees of freedom is also a little bit more convoluted. It has a fancier formula. It is number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. And we can get that number from our calculator output. We got the same formula for chi-squared. We're gonna get our number from our matrices this time. We can get our p-value from 
our calculator either on the chi-squared test or we can use chi-squared CDF. P-value is always going to be between, be between 0 and 1. You'll sketch me a picture. All right, again, we'll label it chi-squared. This will be your number from step 10. All right, always a right-tailed test. And then your degrees of freedom is your mean, and it's just a little bit to the right of that peak. And then state your conclusion. Are you going to reject or fail to reject? Do you have some evidence or not? Okay. All right, so with that, those were our two hypothesis tests. Now we're just going to look at some general guidelines for how we approach these 13 steps in our hypothesis test write-up now that we're in Chapter 11 and moving towards Chapter 13. So now that we're in chapters 11 and 13, we're in the three or more proportions or three or more means, let's adjust our guidelines for the 13 steps. So when you define your parameter, okay, now keeping in mind that in chi-squared we only do it for the goodness of fit, you will only need to write this step up, step out, excuse me, if you are running a chi-squared goodness of fit. You skip this step if you're asked to run this test for independence. But if you are running the goodness of fit, you will have at least two proportions. So I, see, I should see a bunch of P's defined. Right, true proportion of something, true proportion of something. All right, and once we officially get into chapter 13, which I, I get that we're not there quite yet, but we're almost there. But once you get into chapter 13, you're gonna do the same thing because you're gonna have at least two averages. So you're gonna need to define at least two means. So mu sub one is the true average of something up to mu sub k. All right, because as we're in chapters 11 and 13, we're at the three or more level, three or more averages, three or more categories, all right? So with that, let's take a look at the rest of the steps. The next step is to look at our null, and in a goodness of fit, you have a couple of options, and it depends on the wording of the problem. So in a goodness of fit test, set your null proportions to the presented percentages given in the problem. Now, in example one, I gave you percentages. If you remember, that was what type of nut were we dealing with, and we had the percentage of cashews, the percentage of almonds, the percentage of macadamias, and the percentage of Brazils. And they were all different numbers. I think it was 52%, 27%, 13%, 8%. So that's one type of problem where the null proportions are just given and they're different numbers. There will also be problems where the wording implies that every proportion in the null should be equal to one another. Not always the case. We saw that in example two when we were looking at the number of defects made each day of the week. Now, when that happens, when you are looking, when it is implied that every proportion in the null should be equal to one another, you wanna take 100% and divide it by the number of categories. So for example, if there were four categories hypothesized to have the same proportions, then we would do 100% divided by four, which is 25%, and we would write it as a decimal. So if this was the case, my null here would be P sub one equaling P sub two equaling P sub three equaling P sub four, which would be 25%, okay? Now, if there were seven categories, I'd do the same process. It's just I'd be dividing by seven. So I would get 14.3% or 0.413. Here, my null would be even longer. Now I'm gonna go dot, 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 because I'm lazy. So they would all be equal to one another, and on top of that be equal to 0.143. All right, there's gonna be a similar process in chapter 13 when we look at ANOVA. There's gonna be equality in averages. Now, in a chi-squared test for independence, the null's written out in words, so you have three options. You can say that the two categorical variables are independent. You can say the two categorical variables have no relationship, or you can say the two categorical variables have no association, okay? Now, for the alternate, all right, let's scoot this up. Take a look at the alternate. All right, so if we're in a goodness of fit, we'll use the phrase um, for the alternate, we'll just say H naught is not true. All right, if you want, you can also use this phrase. You can say at least one of the true category proportions differs from the corresponding hypothesized value. You are more than welcome to use that one. It's just my guess is that for most of us, we're gonna take a hard pass on writing that phrase out just because it has so many words. Or maybe you just don't wanna write it because you don't understand it. But what we're saying here is, at least one of the proportions differs from what I was told. I won't go so far as to say which proportion it is, but it's saying that the null is not true. In a chi-squared test for independence, the alternate will be written out in words, and you will have three options, right? The two categorical variables are not independent, the two categorical variables have a relationship, or the two categorical variables have an association. Pick one, all right? Uh, our alpha level is always the same, right? If it's not stated, go with 5% as that's the industry standard.
All right, for assumptions, um, in either chi-square test, the deal breaker ass assumption is that all the expected counts must be at least five. If that assumption isn't met, you should stop the problem. This is the assumption that lets us know which distribution we are on and what calculator command we can use in step 11. And in a goodness of fit test, we'll use the formula n times p to calculate those expected counts. But for the test for independence, again, more convoluted, row total times column total over grand total. And in any chi-squared test, you will be given your observed counts. All right, that's always gonna be given to you and you have to calculate your expected values. All right, so that's always gonna be the, the process in step five for these chi-squared tests. Now, I'll, I'll give you a little preview. In chapter 13, we're gonna forego checking assumptions. Oh my God, it's gonna be amazing. All right, in terms of steps six and seven, let me get those into view. All right, so for step six, we're gonna state the name of the distribution used for the test. So in Chapters 11 and 13 will use chi-squared and f, respectively. So chapter 13, excuse me, chapter 11 is all the chi-squareds. Chapter 13 is the f's. When you have two or more proportions, go with the chi-squared. When you're dealing with two or more means, you could go with f. Now, I put two or more here because you can actually, even if you have two sample proportion z-test, you could do a chi-squared test. And, and in all honesty, I prefer it. I think the chi-squared is easier to run than a two sample proportion z. So there's plenty of times when I'm out running tests and I've got two proportions and I'll run the chi-squared version of that test instead of the two sample proportion z. Because I know I'm not supposed to like hate on, on anything I teach, but the, the two sample proportion z test to me is the most annoying hypothesis test I have to run because the assumptions are pretty obnoxious to check. All right. Um, so in terms of stating the name of the test, right, for chapter 11, it will either be the goodness of fit test or the chi-square goodness of fit test or the test for independence, right? So we'll say GOF sometimes because um, that's the acronym for goodness of fit. All right, in chapter 13, we're only going to have the one option. We'll talk about one-way ANOVA. All right, there's also something called two-way ANOVA, but we're not going to cover that in this class, but don't fret. When you major in stats, you'll learn all about two-way ANOVAs. You'll learn about ANCOVAs. We'll go into multiple regression. It starts to get to be a lot of fun. Step eight is calculating those degrees of freedom. And in a chi-squared test, we have two different formulas, uh, depending on which test you're running. For the Goff test, we'll just do K minus one, which is number of categories minus one. In the test for independence, it's a little bit more convoluted, right? Number of rows minus one times number of columns minus one. To give you a preview, when we get into chapter 13, when we're in ANOVA, you actually have two sets of degrees of freedom. So you've got two different formulas to keep track of. We're gonna talk about the degrees of freedom between and the degrees of freedom within. So we're gonna look at K minus one and N minus K, and I'll explain what all of that means. All right, so when we get to the test statistic, all right, so our test statistic for chi-squared is always gonna be observed minus expected squared over expected. That's our individual contributor. We're gonna add those up, sum them in total, and that will be our test statistic. When we get to one-way ANOVA, we're gonna use this ratio of something called mean squares between in ratio to mean squares within, and we're gonna have an F test statistic. All right, when we get to step 10, we're gonna calculate that test statistic but with the numbers filled in for our specific problem. So this will be the same formula in step nine, but with the numbers for your specific problem filled in. Your final answer should be one number, which is gonna be a test statistic. And in chapter 13, we'll use either our calculator output or our mini tab to compute that test statistic. All right, step 11 is that p-value. And p-values we've been saying are probabilities, which means they're numbers between zero and one, always between zero and one. So don't tell me a p-value is 4.7, all right? If, if you see 4.7 on your calculator, there's probably a little e with it, like e to the negative seven, telling you you have some scientific notation and you need to move that decimal over. Um, your p-value, again, it's the probability that if the null were true, you would get sample data like you're seeing, or potentially even more extreme, just through chance alone, just through random variation, because something has to happen in your experiment. So we're trying to see, well, if the null is true, how likely is the thing that I'm seeing, how likely is that to happen? All right, now for, to calculate a p-value, we always need a CDF, all right? Every p-value calculation will require capital P with some parentheses. And in those parentheses, you owe me a letter, a symbol, 
and a number. And here are all of your options. And this is all of your options as we move through all of these hypothesis tests, okay? So you could either use normal CDF, you might potentially use TCDF, you might use chi-squared CDF or FCDF. Those are your four options. Again, proportion land, mean land, three or more proportions, three or more averages. All right, so your letters, because we need letter, symbol, number, you're either gonna use Z, T, chi-squared, or F. For your symbol, it's a less than or a greater than. And the number you use is gonna be the number you used in step 10, or excuse me, the number you calculated in step 10. All right, for chapter 11, we're gonna use chi-squared CDF. And because these statistics are constructed to always be positive, right, because any squared number in math is automatically positive, we will only ever use a right-tailed test. All right, so in other words, the symbol that you're gonna use will always be a greater than. Now, when we get to chapter three, 13, and admittedly, we're not quite there yet, we're about to be, but the same thing is gonna be true for chapter 13. These test statistics will be constructed so that they will always be positive. So in chapter 13 as well, we're always gonna be using the greater than symbol. We'll only be doing a right-tailed test. So if you have a chi-squared or an F, or a chi-squared CDF or an FCDF, one of these two symbols, it's always gonna go with the greater than symbol. All right, step 12, you owe me a picture, and your calculator's pretty good about helping you draw these pictures. Um, you're either gonna go and give me the standard normal curve, you're gonna give me the T distribution, which looks a lot like the Z curves, right? Just higher tails, lower peaks. Uh, you might be giving me the chi-square distribution, which you are for chapter 11, and then in chapter 13, it'll be the F distribution. So label your x-axis with whatever letter you're using, all right? And the number you calculate in step 10 should show up along your x-axis somewhere. And the proportion of areas shaded in your picture should match the p-value you found in step 11. So we have a couple of examples that we've been using this same graphs throughout these chapters. Oops, let me get them all in view, excuse me, there we go. So if we're taking a look at this, right, here's a one sample proportion z-test, it looks like a right-tailed. This looks like a two sample mean t-test, because I see the two tails. This is the chi-squared, you can kind of see it's right skewed, yeah. It's getting close enough to the standard normal, all right, but I've got it labeled chi-squared, there's my test statistic. Right? And here's the F distribution. It's going to look a lot like the chi-squared distribution. It's going to skew right. It's going to be unimodal and skew right. And it will approach the normal distribution as the degrees of freedom increase. But again, I labeled it with F. I've got my test statistic there. All the time, even though they're not always labeled, probability is along the y-axis. Okay? All right. And then last but not least, good old step 13, right? The big finish. What are you ultimately going to do? So you're going to tell me if you're going to reject or fail to reject, and then you're going to tell me if you have sufficient evidence for the alternate or not. All right, so with that, let's head into our last chapter, gang. All right, chapter 13. We're going to learn about one-way ANOVA. I'll see you in a few. Bye.